Great Salt Lake experienced her final glimmering sunset today, succumbing to a long struggle with chronic diversions exacerbated by climate change. She was born 13,000 years ago to Lake Bonneville, who occupied the basin previously, and the Holocene Epoch, who melted and evaporated water. Her dusty remains will be scattered across the Salt Lake Valley for millennia. We will be constantly reminded of her passing by our air quality monitors. She was preceded in death by her cousin, Owens Lake, who lived in California. She was survived by Mono Lake, also of California, whose family took legal action using the public trust doctrine to revive her when she was on life support. During her life, Great Salt Lake underwent many surgeries and amputations. She suffered blockages in her circulatory system, most significantly a transverse incision by a rail causeway, which restricted her flow of her fluids. Although it was common for her to expand and shrink her girth, the last 50 years of her life were especially tumultuous in this regard. When she was at her largest in the 1980s, the state of Utah insisted that she diet with intervention to protect her human neighbors from flooding. Ultimately, the thirst of rapidly growing population upstream, which prevented her from refilling, caused a severe reduction in her size. As water was withheld, she began wasting away. Projects such as an inland port, development of Bear River, the lake's largest tributary, relocating the state prison, and construction of non-essential landfills put much strain on her. In her frail state, she was exposed to the planet, planet's warming temperatures and local drought conditions. The combination of terminal dehydration and high fever caused her eventual demise. Great Salt Lake had a very salty personality and was known to her neighbors as stinky and buggy, but she had the best memory, holding on to every mineral, pollutant, and sediment that she ever encountered. Noted for hosting many around her table, she fed anyone who migrated by. Visitors could count on her being accosted by her biting, her pet biting gnats in the spring, but would always leave her home with the most unique tre treasures. She loved people, especially those native inhabitants of the basin who built caves and traded salt, but also those humans who built funky buildings and partied on her beaches. A nonconformist, Great Salt Lake was infamous for wearing a palette of intriguing colors, not the usual blue of other lakes. Her wardrobe was steeped in lemonade, pink, photosynthetic green, and sandy taupe. Her salty shorelines were ruffled and rugged, and it was her northern red waters and ethereal characteristic that drew artist Robert Smithson to, to Utah to embellish her with his spiral jetty. She demonstrated her care and concern for people by floating them gently in her arms and never allowing them to sink. However, when disturbed, her short temper could quickly whip the heavy waters into frothy waves that would capsize a boat and would leave foam blanketing the shoreline. Although not a skier, Great Salt Lake was an avid donor to the ski industry, contributing her lake effect to what has become known as the greatest snow on earth. During summer months, she enjoyed paddleboarding, canoeing, and sailing. She combined her love of chemistry and aesthetic to create many rusted, rusted pieces of art. She served as a model for many artists over the years who echo echoed her uncommon beauty in their work. She was committed to volunteer for her local environment, spending her time absorbed, absorbing heavy metals and balancing nutrients. Always an avid bird watcher, Great Salt Lake earned a PhD in ornithology, observing 338 species over thousands of years. She was an entrepreneur, supporting an array of businesses from Brian Shrimp, harvesting to salt extraction. As a hobbyist, she collected old boats, railroad, wooden railroad trestles, and an occasional airplane. Great Salt Lake was an award-winning ecosystem. In fact, she was lauded with as a site of hemispheric importance for birds. For centuries, she hosted one of the largest breeding colonies of white pelicans in the world. For decades, she hosted the annual Great Salt Lake Bird Festival, the Great Salt Lake Open Water Swim, and, and Antelope Island Spider Festival. She was noted, she was a noted activist for diversity, understanding that life of all sorts has equal values in the world. Once standing in a protest, she challenged the Utah Department of Environmental Quality to develop water quality standards made difficult by her high salt content, leading to equity for salt lakes everywhere. <laughs> for this work and that, <laughs> For this work and that for her inclusion of Native people in her history, she is often referred to as notorious GSL. There was an action to prevent the, great, the death of Great Salt Lake, but it was too little, too late. 
As she was gasping her dying breath, she influenced the Utah House to pass a concurrent resolution which would acknowledge her condition of desiccation. Quote, now therefore be it resolved that the legislature of U the state of Utah, the governor concurring therein, recognize the critical importance of ensuring adequate water flows to Great Salt Lake and its wetlands to maintain a healthy and suitable lake system, end quote. While this recognized a need for policy and engagement by stakeholders, the resolution did not find any specific remedies. She supported Utah's economy for many years, but we did not adequately fund her health care in time. Had we done so, we may not be mourning her death today. Utah regrets the loss of this unique piece of its identity, as does the lake's namesake, Salt Lake City. The city is still struggling with 7,706 employment casualties when the brine shrimp and salt extraction companies literally dried up. Also, one million tourists no longer visit Utah since the closure of the state and federal lands surrounding Great Salt Lake. With her death, Utahns now pay more for their water treatment and ski season is limited to just a few weeks. We are also suffering additional health costs from dust exposure and spiritual loss of this cultural hub. She will be missed by the 85,000 American white pelicans who nested and fed around the lake, the 5 million eared grebes that fed on the abundant brine shrimp in her salty waters, and the 10 million avian colleagues who loved Great Salt Lake for millennia. The great loss is the opportunity for folks to connect, find common ground, and work together to save her. Her friends and family would like to express thanks to the many people who pleaded for her action on behalf of Great Salt Lake. Our gratitude is extended to state and federal agencies, community members, advocacy groups, and the many research scientists and students who strived to understand her and spread the words about her importance. In lieu of flowers, conserve water and call your legislatures to advocate for small water laws, smart water laws. In keeping with her salty personality, she requested that admirers play the song, Another One Bites the Dust at her memorial. Welcome everybody to another Salty Science Seminar. Today's April 14th, 2021. Um, that, uh, what you just heard was one of our students reading an obituary for Great Salt Lake that Dr. Bonnie Baxter and myself wrote and uh, was published in Catalyst Magazine in November of 2020. You can link to that um, at the QR code in the bottom of uh, your screen. Um, so for today, uh, I'll just go over logistics. If you've been here before, you can go get a drink and get your dinner, whatever you want. Um, there's two ways for you to interact with um, the panelists. You can use the Q&A box. Please use the Q&A box to um, ask questions. And then there's a chat box. If you wanna say hi to your friends, tell people you're here. Um, we know that, that the, um, the attendee list isn't public. So if you wanna say hi, say hi, chat, um, tell us we're being silly and to stop and um, go on to other things. That does happen sometimes, most of the time. Um, we have a Google document with links and resources. Um, you can click on the QR code here um, and we can also put it in the chat function. Um, this has all sorts of links that, that we've um, been, been showing off during this Salty seminar series. Um, anything that, that we link to today will go at the bottom of this. Um, we have lots of events that are on there. Um, we have everything recorded of the Salty Science Seminars. Um, I use playlists to organize everything. So when you go into our YouTube channel, you can um, click on this playlist but button and find Salty Science Seminars. You can find information about the Spiral Jetty or um, the Tar Seeps or hopefully Salt. We'll put a Salt one on there now. Um, we have some more events coming up next week on April 20th. Uh, we have a Grow Your Own Brine Shrimp um, activity at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, it, 
anybody can participate in this. Um, we will send you a free kit. Um, actually, I'm sorry, we can't send you any free kits um, anymore. It's too late, but you can get a free kit at Westminster College. This is going to help us for um, a brand shrimp in the classroom. I uh, lovingly refer to it as BS in the classroom. Um, and we will be doing the science of, of brand shrimp um, with teachers that understand how to work the Utah curriculum um, and can help our students learn about brain shrimp. Um, we just opened uh, an exhibit at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. It's called Confluence and it's with a really great group of um, organizations all centered around water, um, Seven Canyons Trust, Framework Arts, Salt Front, uh, Great Salt Lake Institute at Westminster College. That's where I'm from. I'm Jamie Butler. I didn't introduce myself. Um, and also the Natural History Museum of Utah, along with Ute spiritual leader, uh, Larry Sespooch. Um, the museum actually let us bring in um, live creatures, which is not a very typical museum <laughs> event to let us bring brine shrimp and snails and leeches and um, north arm halophiles. So um, we encourage you, that's gonna be up through December of 2021. And we encourage you to go to the Utah Museum of Fine Arts and check that out. Um, the Natural History Museum is also doing really cool stuff. Um, they have an exhibit called Decisions Downstream. Um, Dr. Sarah Null that has presented at our Salty Science was one of the scientists that helped put that together. We encourage you to do that. Um, go check that out. Um, Nalini Nadkarni, she's um, one of my favorite people. She's a rainforest um, scientist. And I love the way she talks about uh, a tapestry of um, working together and having a tapestry that weaves together all of the things that all of us are doing. Um, I encourage you to go listen to her talk that's tomorrow um, through the Natural History Museum of Utah. Um, and our own Dr. Bonnie Baxter, she's going to be answering questions after uh, science on screen uh, with the Utah Film Center. This is hosted with the Utah Film Center um, with a woman in motion. So um, apparently um, uh, Michelle Nichols, who was a Star Trek um, Star Trek um, celebrity um, heard that they didn't have enough astronauts and went on this wonderful tour and um, recruited over 8,000 people um, to be astronauts and to go into this program, um, including um, lots of people of color and women and um, people that were traditionally not represented in the astronaut community. Um, Bonnie will be answering questions after that. So that'll be April 20th at 7. And Chris Merritt, you're going to hear from Chris Merritt today. Um, he is an industrial archaeologist that I absolutely love to work with. We will be giving a talk at the Great Salt Lake Bird Festival called Old Crap, Bird Crap, and Learned Crap, the Ecology and Historical Archaeology of Great Salt Lake. It's a really fun talk that I love giving with Chris. Um, we were out in the field. Um, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful time to go to Great Salt Lake. Um, actually, this day that we were out here, um, we were, it was the very last day before the gnats came out. So be warned that the biting gnats are out on Antelope Island and to be very, very careful about <laughs> going out there unless you want to be scratching behind your ears and um, itching and scratching and it's really awful. Um, the reason I wanted to show you this, uh, we do have a showcase for our senior students. Some of the students that you see here that are measuring the primary product activity of, uh, of the water at Great Salt Lake will um, be presenting. The links are in the Google Doc that I showed you. Um, I also wanted to uh, give everybody a giant, giant, giant thanks because um, at the last Salty Seminar Series, we um, we did a fundraiser. And this fundraiser, um, I promised to, um, I raised money by getting a mullet. And so, so um, we raised two full summer scholarships for students during that, that um, fundraiser. And I have to admit that um, uh, on April 1st, 
I mean, April Fool's Day, I unveiled my mullet um, at, at Attack of the Giant Brine Shrimp uh, film festival that, that we did. Um, and just remember that it was April Fool's Day. I obviously don't have my mullet yet, but I promise when I am fully vaccinated, I will get my mullet. But it was very fun. Um, I got Bonnie to get a mullet. We all decided to get a mullet while we were out in the field. So here's Bonnie with her mullet. And these are two of our students. This is Kayla Martin with the headband, the Westminster headband and Sierra Watson. Um, they are the recipients of the Jamie Mullet Fund that you all contributed to. And so when you see those uh, students present next summer, they will have a thanks to the Mullet Fund. So thank you, thank you so much. I just wanna point out that Jamie and I are in couples counseling because she lied to me about the mullet. I didn't tell Bonnie. <laughs> I'm, I'm in trouble. I am in deep trouble. Um, well, so let's just uh, dive into this and, and get started. So our first panelist is Laura Vernon. Laura Vernon is the Great Salt Lake Coordinator with the Utah Department of Natural Resources Division of Fire, Forestry, Fire, and State Lands. And she's been working with federal, state, and local governments and industry leaders for over 15 years. Um, we will post her full bio on the YouTube recording, but I, uh, I, I asked her you know, to tell us about um, something funny that happened at Great Salt Lake. And one of her first encounters was in the mid 1990s when she was at Saltaire for a widespread panic concert. And Laura lost one of her shoes in the murky Great Salt Lake quicksand. I've tried to do that before. I almost lost a technician in the Great Salt Lake quicksand. So I'm glad you only lost your shoe. Um, Laura went back with a shovel to retrieve the, to retrieve her shoe the next day, but her shoe was never the same. So, and I was wondering, did you actually find your shoe, Laura? Yeah, I found my shoe. I followed my footprints. I retraced my steps out into the murk. So I started digging <laughs> where, where I could see the struggle. That's where I started digging. And was your foot okay going through the parking lot at Saltaire with like? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Luckily there were no needles back then. You know, it was pretty, it was a cleaner place back then. I, I heard that Chris Merritt really loves rusty stuff and his tetanus shot is up to date. So I hope yours was too at the time. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, well, Laura, take it away. Come tell us about the management of, of Great Salt Lake. If all goes well, I should be sharing my screen. Yeah. All right, are we good? It looks good, Laura. Awesome. All you're, right, well. You are, um, yeah. you're, you're on presenter mode, so mm -hmm. I can see your next slide. Okay. I'm not used to doing this with Zoom, only with Google Meets and only having one screen. And now I have two, so I'm not sure. Let's see if I. Um, how do I turn off the presenter mode? So I only have um, one. I think it's under slideshow. If you look at, yeah, under slideshow. And if I just do. Yep, from beginning, should be good. But now you can still see both, right? Yeah. Yeah, we can. That's weird. I think if you go to display settings, go ahead and click that and then do do the uh, swap presenter and, and slide. View. Go, yeah, select that one. Oh, beautiful. Is that there better? You. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. See, look, it takes a village, right? <laughs> yeah, that's so, the truth. Yeah, yeah. All right. So thank you, uh, Bonnie and Jamie. You guys have had an awesome salty series and I really appreciated all of the events you've brought to the um, to these groups over the last couple of months and I just wanted to throw out there that you may re-hear or see some of the stuff that you've heard in previous presentations but hopefully it's in a little different context. I'm going to be talking about the management of the Great Salt Lake and why I think it takes a village to, um, to manage the Great Salt Lake. So first of all, as Jamie mentioned, I am um, with Forestry, Fire, and State Land. So I wanted to just 
let you know why on earth someone from forestry, fire, and state lands is talking about the bed of the Great Salt Lake. So um, we provide fire, wildland fire assistance and forestry assistance to private landowners in addition to managing all of the state's sovereign lands. So just what are sovereign lands? Um, for those of you that don't know, those are lake beds and river beds that were navigable at the time of statehood. So for Utah, that was in 1896. Uh, boundary is generally below the ordinary high water mark. For Great Salt Lake, we call that the meander line. And it ranges from about 4,202 feet to 4,212. It was marked over a course of 100 years where the lake level did fluctuate somewhat. Um, we manage under the public trust doctrine. So these lake beds and river beds are yours. They're lands that are held in trust by the state, but they're for the public. And we also manage under multiple use sustained yield principles similar to the BLM or the Forest Service. There's not one use that supersedes another. We need to consider a range of uses on our lands. Um, altogether, we have 1.5 million acres of uh, lake and riverbed and 2,500 miles of shoreline. And those are primarily on Great Salt Lake, um, as you can imagine. Um, the other navigable bodies of water that we manage are the Utah portion of Bear Lake, Bear River, Jordan River, Utah Lake, and portions of the Green in Colorado. And as I mentioned before, we manage under the public trust doctrine and we need to consider a range, consider impacts to all of these um, resources when we're considering whether to um, allow a project to move forward or not. So we need to consider um, how things would impact navigability, uh, fish and wildlife habitat, water quality, uh, recreation, and of course, aquatic beauty. Um, straight out of state code, you don't have to read this all, and I'm certainly not going to, but I just wanted to let you know, these are all of the management responsibilities of the division. A couple of ones I wanted to point out was that we need to manage, we need to develop strategies to deal with a fluctuating lake level. So we don't manage to a lake level. It's not like 4,200 is the best, and we need to get there. We need to manage at the current lake level, um, and so that's a challenge. We're always adapting into what we're, we're doing. Um, central to this talk tonight is we're all so supposed to coordinate activities um, with the various uh, divisions within the Department of Natural Resources, other stakeholders, and also retain and encourage the Great Salt Lake technical team to do all of the awesome work that they've been doing over the last 20 years. So um, also we're required to do a comprehensive management plan for the Great Salt Lake for all of our sovereign land bodies. This is as comprehensive as it gets. You've probably seen this before. This is our lake level matrix. Just really quickly down the Y axis, you have the lake levels. Across the top, you have the resources. You have water, wetlands, uh, biology, recreation, economics. So how are, at what lake level elevation is optimal for each of these uh, resources? So green is generally, green is good. Yellow is okay and orange, not so great. So if you blur your eyes, well, this is pretty blurry anyway, but you can see that that kind of sweet spot for the Great Salt Lake is around 4204 to 4198. Um, so that's where most things are, are good, golden. Things are, the resources are operating at the optimal capacity. But I know you have seen this slide before in some other presentations. Um, this is overlaid, the matrix, um, overlaid with the historic lake level. And here you can see that, um, you know, since the early 2000s, we haven't been operating in the green. And when we did the matrix, we were just, you know, kind of thinking that things would head back up in our favor, but it's looking like they're not. So we need to figure out how to manage um, in the orange. Um, and so we're looking at updating our management plan to, um, to address the lower lake level concerns. Um, I, as you may have guessed, uh, the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands uh, can't do it alone. We're not the only ones that have any responsive or have any sort of responsibility on the lake. Um, there's a bunch of different entities and they're all responsible for a bunch of different things, which can be uh, difficult and confusing, but it also can be advantageous um, to us. So 
uh, in the management plan, we kind of outline who's responsible for permitting, who's responsible for management, and who's responsible for research. And you can see that we're responsible for all three, but many entities aren't. And we need to make sure we're going to the right people, the right agencies when we're wanting to do projects or we're needing some answers. Um, we need to make sure we're coordinating with the right entity. And there's a ton, there's a lot of them out there. So um, a lot of people involved in the Great Salt Lake and all of their mandates and missions are different. Um, so what do we know about the Great Salt Lake and why do we care? Um, well, we know a lot more than we did 10, 20 years ago, thanks to Bonnie, Jamie, Ryan, and so many people that are out there on the ground doing tons of research. We know a lot about the lake, but we need to know more. We need to know more about what's happening upstream. We need to know how changes to our climate are impacting the Great Salt Lake. Um, and we should care because I think it's becoming more and more evident the more um, research that's done, um, how important uh, ecologically, economically, and culturally the lake is to, to Northern Utah and really to the world. Um, I condensed this slide. I could do a whole presentation on the value of the Great Salt Lake, obviously, but um, the values are numerous. We talked about the, well, in the obituary, I think they highlighted most of these things, but the migratory birds, millions and millions of migratory birds that stop over um, in the spring and the fall, the Wilson's phalaropes and the Eared's grebe, the largest staging concentrations of these species. Um, you've got the brine shrimp population, 40% of the world's brine shrimp um, come from the Great Salt Lake and they're dried and processed, they're pro dried and processed and then fed to fish and shrimp uh, as their food. So if you've enjoyed a shrimp cocktail recently or some fish, chances are pretty good that you've been um, consuming food that consumed food from the Great Salt Lake. Um, Recreation is a huge thing. We've got three state parks around the lake. Um, there's swimming, birding, hunting, all of these contribute uh, to the Great Salt Lake uh, quality of life and economy. And then of course there's mineral extraction, um, you know, from just the sodium chloride or salt that's harvested that's put on roads to um, sulfate of potash that's fertilizer for almonds and other crops. And so um, the 14% of the world's magnesium comes from the Great Salt Lake and 100% of the magnesium that is used in the United States um, comes from the Great Salt Lake. So if you've held a soda pop can in your hand recently, you sat on a stadium bench at a, um, at a sports outing, you get in your car and drive, you're connected to the Great Salt Lake. The magnesium from all of those products has come from the Great Salt Lake. So again, I think you've seen this before, but I'm just trying to further highlight the importance of the Great Salt Lake. 1.3 billion in annual economic uh, impact to the state. You have 375,000 in labor income and uh, over 7,700 jobs related to the Great Salt Lake. So what if all of these wonderful amenities that the lake has to offer dry up? What if the climate continues to change and bring us less water, the increased diversions are happening? Um, we're starting to understand now more and more what the impacts of that could be. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the recent studies that have gone on that are just gonna talk about how impactful that could be to, um, to Northern Utah and to the state as a whole. Um, Dr. Sarah Knoll did a study in 2016 that talked about how the lake is right now 11 feet lower because of human occupation, because of our agricultural industrial um, uh, use and our, the, sorry, the municipal uses and impounded wetlands. And this is a 48% decrease or reduction in lake volume from what it would be if humans were not occupying the Wasatch Front and or back. Um, and then the study goes on to say that there could be an additional eight feet of decrease if water development continues and that would expose uh, 30 more miles of lake bed. Um, another study that was recently completed commissioned by the Great Salt Lake Advisory Council 
was, you know, we wanted to look at how um, how other terminal lakes around the world are dealing with desiccation. And so we looked at about a dozen lakes and what the impacts were of the drying lakes. And um, the results were pretty disastrous, but here's the picture of the RLC in Uzbekistan. Um, you can see how the decrease from the 1960s to 2009, it's pretty much that's just a dust bowl now. Um, as the obituary also mentioned, here's a picture of Owens Lake from 1913 and then 2016. The report basically says the drying uh, of the saline lakes cost billions of dollars and is a disaster to human health and the environment. Um, Owens Lake has, LA County has invested millions, I'm sorry, billions annually just to keep the dust down from um, you know, flooding the, the, sh the lake bed, um, planting crops, um, putting plastic balls on, on top of the, um, the remaining water to keep it down. Um, so the very costly once the lake is starting to dry up. Another study that we just completed, well, in 2019, looked at the potential cost of the drying lakes. We know how much uh, economic um, investment we see from the lake but what is it going to cost the state if, if things dry up? And so we see here, you can see what the cost would, would be, but then it would also total about $1.6 to $2.1 billion in potential cost annually to mitigate the impacts of the drying Great Salt Lake. This would all, of course, depend on how low the lake actually got. So um, in my new role as the Great Salt Lake Coordinator, come to think of the Great Salt Lake as a wicked problem. Um, in planning and policy circles, it's um, a wicked problem is a term that's used to talk about a super complex issue where there's incomplete knowledge, where there's a number of people and opinions about how things should be done, where there's a large economic burden to solve the problem, and where there's interconnectedness of, um, of the issues if you try and um, if you try and solve one issue, then that changes, adversely impacts another issue. So, um, so we've got this wicked problem called the Great Salt Lake. And, and the best way I can think to deal with it is to get all hands on deck, all hands on board, all these entities that I've talked about um, and more. We need the support of, of groups. It, you know, it takes a village, like I said, to to make sure that we have enough water in the lake and that it's healthy. Um, here's a, just a little graphic of how many entities are involved in the Great Salt Lake. You have all the Department of Natural Resources um, and Department of Environmental Quality, but then you have the federal agencies as well. Um, some of the other groups that I could also talk forever about, uh, the Great Salt Lake Advisory Council, they're kind of the nexus or, um, you know, if you do some research, on the Great Salt Lake, and it's um, you know has the potential to um, if if you're looking to change policy or have um, have some decisions made at a legislative level, let's get the information to the council, and they can elevate it to that. But they want to inform the debate on the importance of the Great Salt Lake. You have the Great Salt Lake Technical Team that does all the research. Um, the Salinity Advisory Committee, I haven't talked much about them. Chris Merritt will talk about the railroad causeway, but there's a whole breach, a recently completed breach in there that um, will um, that we can modify based on salinity levels if we need to. And, and, I, and I am tasked with doing this for our division, and I don't know what the ideal salinity levels are because it's so complicated. So I'm depending on um, the Salinity Advisory Committee to help me out. And the Great Salt Lake Ecosystem Program does help with, um, or they regulate the brine shrimp uh, industry to make sure that there's sustainable brine shrimp operations. And then finally, um, this harsh red outline here um, is the boundary for the new watershed council that was created uh, in a bill that Representative Hawks ran uh, two years ago. And they're in the process of developing this now, but I wanted to put this up here as a point that everyone within this red boundary needs to understand the importance of the lake and work together to, um, to save it. And if that means water conservancy districts, local governments, uh, universities, 
legislators. Um, we all need to, to work with each other and we don't want winners and losers. We just need to come up with some, some opportunities that will um, benefit, for example, ag users and the lake as well. So with that, I have nothing else. Thank you, Laura. Um, I, you know, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting to me because I've been working at the lake since 1999 and I had no clue about all of these different agencies. And so I'm, you know, really glad that you could um, come in and share with us about um, um, partnerships that can happen. And I hope all of our audience is, you know, listening to um, this, this not only complex, complex ecosystem, but this um, complex ecosystem of managers at the same time. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, we were going to hear about the railroad causeway, but Chris Merritt has a state computer that is uh, um, screwing up. And so we are going to go right now to uh, Ryan Rowland. And I'm so glad that Ryan can be here. Um, Ryan is a hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey's Utah Water Science Center in West Valley City. Um, and he's been working in this career for over 20 years and has participated in and led many ground and surface water studies. Um, and something interesting about Ryan, and I don't quite know how you get over this, um, is Ryan is terrified by spiders. And I mean, I, I, I'm sure a lot of you have been out and about around Great Salt Lake in the summertime, and there are ginormous orb weavers by the bazillions. I mean, the biomass of orb weaver spiders is um, so incredible. And it doesn't help, it doesn't help at all to know that they don't bite <laughs> because <laughs> because they're everywhere and they crawl on you and they used to get in my hair when I would work on the docks and I was um, catching eared grebes and I would be driving home from the lake and a giant orb weaver would come out of my hair and it, it doesn't ever help to know <laughs> that they don't bite. So Ryan, thank you for coming. Thank you for talking to us about um, the salt of Great Salt Lake. So go ahead and share and take it away. All right, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. And <clears throat> yeah, I spend a lot of time traumatized uh, when I'm working out on Great Salt Lake during the summer when there's a lot of spiders out and about. Ryan, how do you deal with them? What Do you have special techniques to deal with the spiders? Uh, I just try to pretend they're not there. I don't know. There's no, you know, I do know ultimately that they're harmless. So uh, but I've been in situations where I've had five or six of them on my body from rubbing against rocks or railings out there. And um, I don't know, I, 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 like I said, I'm traumatized. I don't really deal with it very well. I just do what I can to get by. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're not scared of data. Uh, yeah, no. Data is what we do. So thanks, everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm I work for the USGS, uh, the Utah Water Science Center. Um, we do a lot of work um, on Great Salt Lake, and that's due to, to um, our terrific state cooperators. So a lot of this work wouldn't be possible without uh, our state cooperators, including the Utah Department of Natural Resources and the Utah Department of Environmental Quality. So um, we just we want to make sure that uh, that we acknowledge those agencies. It makes our jobs possible out there. The USGS, uh, when we do a lot of work, it's a cooperative effort. We have to have funding from, from our cooperators, and then we bring matching funds to studies. And those matching funds are thanks to you, all the people out there watching this presentation. So special thanks to you. So the, the cooperative matching funds come from the people of the United States, uh, United States from tax revenues. So everybody around the country is invested in, in Great Salt Lake. So I'm gonna give a quick overview of Great Salt Lake. I'm sure the people who are watching today um, will know uh, some of the basics about the lake, but they're worth just uh, going, going over to get us all on the same page. And then I'm just gonna discuss some recent salinity monitoring that we're doing on the lake and then uh, how to access the data. So as we all know, Great Salt Lake is a terminal lake. Um, the, uh, 
the uh, sol dissolved solutes that make their way into the lake stay there and uh, water evaporates and that's how we get high salinity in the lake. And then in 1959, we have a railroad causeway that was constructed um, that essentially has split this lake into two. Uh, although they are interconnected, there is flow uh, between the north uh, arm and the south arm, but the north arm receives very little uh, fresh water. 95% of the fresh water inflows uh, enter the, the south arm. And so uh, therefore the south arm has a rough, has a, you know, less uh, salinity about 160 grams per liter. The north arm is around 300 grams per liter. Um, it, so the, the railroad causeways had a profound effect uh, on, on the lake. And with this uh, salinity and, and density gradient that's set up um, uh, across the, the, the causeway, um, we get bi-directional flow that happens um, across the causeway. And basically we have south arm water, uh, will we'll, uh, flow um, just due to the um, he head difference. The, the water level on the south side of the causeway tend, it tends to be higher. So south arm water will flow over to the, to the north arm. And then the density, the high density of the north arm water uh, will force north arm water to flow uh, to the south arm of the lake. And what that does is it sets up this persistent high salinity uh, deep brine layer that has a lot of funky chemistry associated with it. And maybe in previous talks in this series, you've discussed how this, uh, this deep brine layer tends to be anoxic. It tends to have elevated methylmercury um, and it tends to be persistent. So, um, so on the south arm of the lake, we have a, a relatively um, lower salinity uh, a, a water body on top of this higher salinity deep brine layer. And then, you know, we have this very high salinity water on the north arm. So we've got this kind of three component uh, uh, lake in terms of uh, salt masses. Um, so, uh, um, you know, a lot of our work is kind of focused on, on characterizing uh, the masses of salt in each of these uh, reservoirs and ultimately to understand how those salt masses uh, uh, exchange or, or, or move around from the different uh, salt masses. So the majority of the work that we're doing right now with the USGS is focused on the south arm of the lake. And um, we have stream gauges on um, all the major surface water inflows, including the, the Bear River uh, near Corinne, Utah. We have the Reaver River near Plain City. Farmington Bay outflow, and then the Goggin drain. So these are the major surface water inflows, and these waters all make their way into the south arm of the lake. Um, in addition, we have a, a monitoring station at the new breach that Laura Vernon mentioned, a very, very important site. We have a lot of important uh, monitoring sites around the state of Utah, but this is in my top three or four um, for monitoring sites, just because it's so critical to the management of this lake going forward. Uh, we also have many monitoring stations in the south arm of the lake. Um, I'm just showing one of the sites uh, here. It's GSL 3510, and I'll show you some data from that site here in just a second. Um, we have about eight long-term sites in the south arm, long-term monitoring sites, and, and many other sites that we've, we've um, visited over, over the years. I should uh, mention that at the uh, monitoring station on the new breach, we, we do perform monthly discharge measurements and we have um, approximately monthly uh, water quality sampling that happens there. We do not do continuous uh, discharge monitoring like we would at a regular stream gauge and we'll get into that in a little bit. And then the monitoring at the open lake uh, or the, um, the lake sites is, uh, you know, it's, it's done on a, approximately a monthly basis uh, with help from forestry fire and state lands. So this is actually the most important plot I'll show you guys today. Uh, this is um, the salinity that's measured at GSL 3510, going back to about 2011. Um, we use what's called the uh, Great Salt Lake Equation of State, published by Dave Naffs and others in 2011, to compute salinity values. We, so we'll measure density in the water sample, and then we'll plug that uh, density and, and water temperature into the equation of state, and we, we can calculate a salinity value. It uh, provides a, a nice, uh, robust, and affordable way to get at an estimate of salinity. Uh, and um, 
the salinity trends you see on the plot, they're related to the um, elevation of the, of the south arm, uh, freshwater inflows, and then modifications that happen um, at the causeway. So let's just take a look at this plot um, very, uh, you know, briefly here where uh, this, again, it's for 3510, and the triangles are for uh, samples collected from just be below the water surface, like roughly a half a meter. So this is kind of that upper brine layer that's uh, less, less saline um, than the deep brine layer. And then the, tr the circles are collected from deep water, ba basically where the deep brine layer uh, would be. And these samples are uh, taken from about a half meter off the bottom. And then also on this plot, I'm showing the elevation of, of Great Salt Lake measured at our uh, uh, gauge station at the uh, Great Salt Lake Marina on the south end of the lake. So, you know, quickly you, you notice that the density values for the deep samples, so the circles, uh, tend to be, you know, higher than the, than the water collected from the shallow, uh, 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 shallow uh, location. And, and that gets back to what we just discussed, how North Arm water uh, flows southward and, and um, pl plunges to depth and is persistent along the bottom. Um, but we see that the, these values, uh, these density values started to converge uh, around uh, 2014. And that's due to closure of some old culverts on the railroad causeway. So these culverts allowed some water flow between the north and the south, and they were condemned they needed to be replaced and they were actually shut down. And when that happened, the density values um, at both depths, uh, 3510, they, they converged. So the, the deep brine layer essentially mixed out um, after those culverts were, were closed. And then uh, later on, when the new breach was opened, um, the density values for deep and shallow waters begin to diverge once again. And so we see the development of the deep brine layer um, and um, how it's uh, separated from uh, the um, shallower water with, with less density. The other things you see in the data are, you know, if you look at lake elevation as it increases, you see that the shallow water tends to have density values that decrease along with that. So that's due to the flux of fresh water coming into the lake. And then as south water uh, uh, elevations drop, um, evaporative concentration kicks in, the density values tend to rise. So we have a very detailed record of uh, density and salinity um, for the uh, south arm of the lake, which is used by a lot of stakeholders to kind of keep their fingers on the pulse uh, of the lake. And here's just a, quickly the Great Salt Lake Equation of State, uh, which is um, an aquatic geochemistry, and it just simply relates density, salinity, and temperature in, a, in one equation. And so we just uh, will measure density and uh, temperature and we'll, we'll solve this equation for salinity and um, that's how we estimate salinity in the south arm of the lake and it is specific to the south arm of the lake. So let's talk a little bit about um, our monitoring at the surface water inflow sites. So um, we, we, we know from uh, historic data uh, and, public and, and publications uh, regarding that data that the annual load of salts coming in from the freshwater inflow sites uh, are estimated to, to range anywhere from 3.5 to 16.6 million tons um, per year. Um, but we also know that there's a great deal of uncertainty associated with, with, with those estimates. They're based on periodic uh, sampling um, and um, uh, some extrapolation, et cetera. So, um, there's a large uncertainty and we, we uh, are endeavoring to um, reduce um, that uncertainty by utilizing continuous uh, monitoring technology at these inflow sites. And what that basically means is that we um, are going to, well, when we have done this, we've installed uh, specific conductance sensors, which measure um, is essentially salinity. They measure uh, how well water will carry a current. The more ions in solution, the better it will carry a current, the higher the conductivity. So in 2019, we, um, we installed uh, continuous or specific conductance sensors in the freshwater sites. We had them logging continuously. We also collected samples for total dissolved solids. And total dissolved solids is, is a kind of a direct measure of, of salinity. Um, so we use that data and some historical specific conductance and TDS data from, from you know, periodic samples that had happened to develop um, equations specific to each state, uh, surface water and flow site 
that allow us then going forward to um, compute um, a continuous record of salinity based on specific conductance measurements that are made continuously. So these equations that we've developed are going to be published in a USGS uh, open file report very shortly. Um, and as I mentioned, this is going to allow for continuous measurements um, of, of salinity, which, which are important because specific conductance um, varies quite a bit at, at these freshwater inflow sites. And those, this is just an example of a specific conductance, uh, continuous specific conductance measurement at the Weaver River near Plain City for uh, water year 2019. Um, you can see the values range from about 500 all the way up to over 2,000 microsiemens. Um, so, you know, having a, a high resolution record like this um, for a TDS is going to definitely reduce uncertainty for the uh, salinity estimates from inflows. Now to the new breach, um, the most important site um, on Great Salt Lake as far as I'm concerned right now. Uh, it's a very interesting site. We have bidirectional flows, as we discussed a little bit earlier. Uh, but then interestingly, during uh, wind events, um, we will get very interesting flows out there uh, where we'll have all north to south flow or we'll have all south to north. And just quickly thinking about that for a second, it becomes obvious you will need some kind of continuous monitoring technology to, to quantify the flows accurately. Um, and uh, also to, then to get to, at the salt mass exchange. Um, so this is an example of one of our technicians making a discharge measurement, a manual discharge measurement with an acoustic Doppler velocity uh, meter. So this just gets towed back and forth across this channel. And um, this instrument measures uh, velocities and, uh, and the area, the cross-sectional area, and then we're able to get at a, a discharge value. Um, we have an uplooking velocity meter at the new breach. So this is um, secured to an anchor. It's sitting on the bottom and it's measuring velocities throughout the water column uh, from the bottom up to the surface. And um, this chart shows data from this instrument and how we get these uh, flow reversals dur during wind events. So this orange line represents zero velocity. Um, anything above the line, uh, orange line represents uh, south to north uh, velocity and anything below represents uh, north to south velocity. So we had a strong south wind event, a prefrontal frontal event um, in November of uh, 2020. Uh, with those strong south winds, uh, we had all um, of the, um, uh, flow moving uh, from the south to north direction. Uh, not surprising. The water, uh, the, the, the wind is pushing the water towards the, the breach and, and forcing all the water to move uh, north through the breach. Um, then uh, after the front passed, we had a strong uh, northwest uh, wind event um, from a winter storm and that pushed water from the north to south, and it's it's uh, there's a there's enough water that gets pushed and piled up along the, the causeway that you have essentially all 100% um, flow moving from from north to south. So it's a very dynamic uh, um, uh, site, and it's going to uh, require a, a large effort to to um, quantify both uh, the amount of water and the, the amount of uh, salt mass that's moving through that new breach. Um, Right now, we're making these manual uh, monthly discharge measurements. I showed you the picture of the technician moving the, the velocity instrument across the channel. And so these are done monthly um, under strictly calm conditions. Um, this plot shows the data we've collected uh, so far. Uh, the data, uh, the, the discharge measurements began um, in, uh, later in 2016, and, the, and we have them running out all the way to these last values at the beginning of just uh, last, last month. Uh, the blue circles are discharge moving from south to north. The red circles are discharge moving north to south. And then I'm showing the head difference, um, so, uh, which is, I'm showing how much higher the, the, the water level is on the south uh, side of the breach relative to the north side of the breach. And remember that gets back to 
the south side gets uh, all the fresh water inflows. So when they opened up that new breach, the um, the water level on the south side was was much higher than um, on the north side of the lake. We had about a three foot uh, head difference. And not surprising when they opened that new breach, we had huge flows of water moving south, south to north, up to 5,000 CFS. And because that head difference was so large, it was actually zero flow, zero amount of water moving north to south. And as the, uh, the head difference declined, you see the, blue, the uh, south to north flows also declined. Uh, and then you know, several months later, once the uh, head difference got to a level, uh, would allow that bi-directional flow to kick in, we start to see the, some uh, north to south flow. And, you know, just kind of eyeballing this, tracking this, you see that as the head difference gets bigger on a seasonal basis, then uh, south to north flows begin to increase in the opposite direction, they begin to decrease. There's very interesting things that happen um, as things kind of, uh, well, as the head difference begins to kind of drop uh, moving through through the water year, and we'll, we'll get to points where we have actually more more flow moving from the north side to, to the south side. Um, so it's a it's a fascinating uh, data set, and it's going to be um, absolutely critical to um, getting us to a point where we have con uh, continuous monitoring of, of discharge um, at this site. And, uh, and continuous monitoring is absolutely our goal. We understand how important this site is for management of, of Great Salt Lake. To get us there to a continuous monitoring paradigm, we're, we're installing and have installed uh, lots of really neat equipment. So um, this is just a, 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 sh a photo showing um, our uh, water elevation uh, sensor and a surface water velocity sensor that are mounted uh, right at the new breach. So these are um, uh, down looking instruments. They're sending uh, uh, signals down that are pinging off of the water surface to, to get us uh, uh, elevation and um, velocity data. We've also installed um, elevation sensors, uh, lake elevation sensors at the new causeway. We have one that's or at, at the causeway. We have one that's uh, measuring north arm water at the causeway. We have a sensor that's measuring on the south uh, arm on the causeway. You can see how it'd be really important to know those head differences right there at the causeway to understand those flow dynamics. And then the next thing that we're going to do is install a resistivity uh, sensor chain and, and the inverse of res resistivity is conductivity. So that's kind of a, it's a measurement of, of salinity. This is gonna be a, um, a chain that um, with sensor space 10 centimeters apart, they're going to be uh, run from the bottom up through the, uh, the, the boundary layer between the north uh, to south and south to north flow regime. Um, this instrument is going to help us um, zero in um, uh, on the location of the uh, flow boundary between the different directions, which is very, very important for modeling flows at the new breach um, and even calculating flows um, in real time using uh, velocity profile data. Um, this is being done with help from the USGS hydrogeophysics branch. And this is the actual uh, resistivity sensor chain here. Uh, they, they are building this um, at their um, own expense. Um, and um, we're very excited to install this actually later this month. Uh, this is the sensor chain sitting in uh, David Ray's office uh, who actually built this, uh, custom built this, this chain. So we're very excited to do this and we think this is gonna be a big step forward for the, for the new breach. Um, kind of winding down here, um, you know, accessing USGS data is actually a pretty simple endeavor. And uh, the, the, the way I, I access data um, is actually by using the Inwis Mapper um, uh, website and you can see the URL down at the bottom and all I've done is I've gone to this website and I've just zoomed in on Great Salt Lake and you can see all of our active monitoring locations here. Uh, you can even see our stream gauges. There's the Plain City gauge um, and you just simply zoom in on, on the site location and click on it and you will get a uh, pop-up that says access data and you click on that and you will get there. Um, 
another great way to kind of drill your way into to USGS data is to go ahead and go to our Utah Water Science Center homepage. And here's the, the URL here. Um, this is, this is um, a relatively new, newly designed web page. And actually, if you go to Utah, if you go to other water science centers, uh, web pages around the country, USGS water science centers, the, the web pages are going to look very similar to this. It's been a huge effort to get uh, all of our pages looking this nice across the country. But here's a link to NWIS Mapper. Here's a, a button that will link you to all of our real time stream flows, um, all of our Great Salt Lake elevation data. Um, we have other various uh, real-time monitoring stations that you can access um, via, via this button. So um, the other thing I'd point out is publications. You can get access to our uh, most recent publications and actually kind of search around and, and locate pretty much any publication the Utah Water Science Center has, has produced. So um, I encourage you, you to, to take advantage of this website and um, enjoy accessing the data. It's one of uh, the things we take a lot of pride in is making all of our data accessible to the public. Um, you know, we're not perfect. Uh, when data are put to the, to the public website, they're, they're noted as provisional um, uh, and we endeavor to get it into an approved status, um, but just, just be aware it's there for you um, and all researchers. Okay, and just to wrap up, there's my contact information. So if you have any questions regarding Great Salt Lake, please feel free to give me a ring. I'm very happy to talk to you or, or send me an email. That's it for me. Thank you, Ryan. Hey, I do have a question I wanted to ask you um, before. Um, this is from Annaville. Will you tell everybody about the range of velocity of the heavy brines? And also is the velocity of the brine river flow at a constant decreasing rate, the further away it gets from the breach? And does it go south? Okay, so the deep brine layer, I think that's what Ann, yeah, that's what Ann is talking about. So, right, as that north arm water crosses through the breach and plunges down to depth because it has higher density, it does move, it, could, it does migrate from the north from north to south, it makes its way uh, down uh, to the south part of the lake. Um, and we have measured velocities there uh, with uh, uplooking velocity meters like we have at the new breach. And there are events where we see velocities on the order of 100 centimeters per second, which is just remarkable, remarkably fast velocities. And they're related to these storm events. Um, Dave Naffs has published a, a, a paper, I don't uh, remember which journal or what year right offhand, where he talks about some of that velocity data um, and how remarkable it is. Uh, but yeah, definitely there's velocity in that deep brine layer. Cool. Thank you, Ryan. Hey, and I mean, you just you just gave us a lot of really technical information, and I just wanted to maybe boil it down for some of our folks that maybe aren't as technically inclined. Um, so there's a railroad causeway, and it splits the lake into two, and it prevents water from flowing in the fresh water from flowing into the north arm. So the north arm water is um, very heavy. It's as salty as water can get. And so it's very dense. You do float very good. We hear about floating on Great Salt Lake. And um, I do have pictures of my husband floating in that pink north arm water with a 40 pound border collie on his belly and his toes are still poking out and he's still, could read the newspaper. So we have this really dense water and then we have this causeway. And I, I want to show people, not everybody gets to go on boats and um, check out this causeway. So I, I would like to show you, this is a um, time lapse of going through the causeway from the north. You can see in this picture, in this video, we're in pink water in this boat right now. And um, <laughs> Oh, 
and we get to go right to that causeway. But unlike unlike boats, that dense water, it sinks to the bottom of Great Salt Lake and it forms a layer called the deep brine layer. Um, and the flow of that water is dynamic over time, depending on what fresh water is coming in and what the wind is doing. And um, so those are kind of my three points that I wanted to bring out. If you're maybe not so technical, there's a deep brine layer. Um, there can be differences in um, how that flow goes back and forth through the causeway. And I think, um, you know, we work a lot with teachers and students and uh, Dr. Bonnie Baxter um, has had a, um, do you want to tell them about your class? Oh, yeah. So like one of the things about the lockdown situation um, in education over the course of the last year is we've, we've learned a lot about what we can do. And um, I had this experience of designing a course where the students couldn't come to lab and um, we called it science of salinity and a chemistry professor and I taught the course together. So it was from a biology and chemistry perspective. And we actually like uh, boxed up supplies and sent them to every student. And so students actually, you know, did experiments in their kitchen uh, with the equipment we'd sent them. And we sent them a mail back label. So after they were done, they, they sent it back. So this was last spring, um, a year ago. And it was really um, kind of amazing that it, it, it happened. And the students were so happy to be doing lab work. I can't tell you like whether they were doing it on the back porch. Um, so I'll just quickly show you a couple of pictures. Um, we did this density activity and um, Jamie, Jamie asked me if I would share some of this because Ryan's talk was reminding her of this. Um, and, and so really what, what we were, were doing was having the students really get at the difference in density of the salt content. And so one of their instructions was we sent them different samples from Great Salt Lake from different parts of Great Salt Lake. So we mailed this to Ohio and Virginia and wherever else, this box of supplies and they get these different tubes of samples and they get a refractometer, uh, they get a balance, they get um, a graduated cylinder, they got all of this um, nice, lab gear there really wasn't that expensive it was it, it it actually might be an amazing model going forward for future science education um and and so we asked them to build a colored tower to put different colors in the samples and and some of the students were pretty bright and they researched like what does the north arm look like and what does the south arm look like and they made the colors match um, so they might have dyed their north arm sample pink and their south arm sample green, for example. And uh, so we sent them tubes and graduated cylinders, and they were really examining this on their own. Um, and so you see, like, you know, they're in their parents' kitchen and they're making these towers of density, which is really fun. Um, somebody's on the back deck because their mom was like, no way are you doing that in my kitchen. <laughs> And then there's the student who sent us this picture and said, I had to sacrifice my roommate's beer pong table in order to do my lab experiments. So just so you know, uh, sometimes they give up drinking just to do science, which I think is pretty funny. Um, and during the course of this experiment, like students made memes, which was hilarious. That was just hilarious. Like we didn't anticipate um, how much they were missing us and missing college and missing science. And so these pictures of them in their parents' kitchen from their childhood rooms is just really fun. Anyway, um, density. So um, yeah, have students play with density. Uh, that's my advice to teachers. That was really an amazing experience. Um, do you guys... I don't know if in this series you've shown people a video of the new breach being opened that shows, mm. have you guys ever showed that to this group? No, I have that video handy. That would be fantastic. It's very short. So. Yeah, show that. That's great. Yeah, All right, let's, let me show you that. 
And I know that there's some families online here. One of my favorite, favorite eight-year-olds, Kala, I think she's probably on here. And maybe we can um, help some families do some cool density experiments. Okay, so <clears throat> did that share? I can't tell. Yeah, this is yeah. Perfect. yeah we got it. All right. Um, so they have finished building the new bridge, the new breach, and now there's some big tractors that are removing uh, material away from the, they had a coffer dam here. So they're opening up the coffer dam. And right now at this point, um, the south arm here is about three feet higher in elevation than the north arm to the right. And watch what happens as these tractors excavate away the, the coffer dam. Yeah, here we go. There it goes. 5,000 5, CFS. Wow. Water moving north. Um, so you can imagine a huge uh, bit of a dilution having that lower salinity water moving into the north arm. So diluting the north arm a little bit. Uh, I but anyway, that's just. I heard Oh, sorry. I heard there was a pretty good wave that you could catch on the north arm when that was happening. People wanted to take their kayaks out there. And um, I know a lot of people were very worried about people's safety. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No kidding. I, do, I have a question. Um, Ryan, is the north arm water relatively wind or otherwise mixed? Or is that density stratified? If stratified, does the new breach still have a depth that influences the deep water exchange? So the deep, the north arm actually is stratified. Um, and Andrew Rupke with the Utah Geological Survey, he and his, his folks do a lot of uh, profiles in the north arm. And I've looked at some of that data and it, it, it is stratified. So. Uh, yeah, that that plays into the amount, uh, you know, to the concentration of uh, the, the salinity concentration in the north arm water that, that travels southward. So it's definitely it's a factor that stratification, um, and it's it's important. Like um, like I say, our our work is generally it's focused basically on on the south arm and at that new breach. So I kind of feel bad that we don't uh, actually do any profiles on the north arm just because I'm so interested in it. But thank goodness we have Andrew at UGS. <laughs> He's done a fantastic job. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for all of your information and all of the data that you look through. Thank you. I do. I do spiders better than data. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> hey, well, I'm really excited to introduce you to our next panelist, um, Chris Merritt. He received his PhD from the University of Montana in anthropology in 2010, um, and he was um, focused on the archaeological and historical investigations from the overseas Chinese. Um, he also has a master's in industrial archaeology from Michigan um, Technological University, um, and, and I... I asked about, you know, how uh, <laughs> anything quirky that you could think about, um, and just as being an archaeologist is um, already defines Chris as being kind of quirky. Um, he definitely loves rusty stuff. He does believe in Sasquatch, and his tetanus booster shot is up to date to deal with his rusty stuff loving and. Um, I personally enjoy spending my time with Chris. He's definitely a, 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 an avid Great Salt Lake nerd. Um, I did get to cross the railroad causeway, the loosened cutoff that he's going to talk about with Chris. And every time I go into the field with him, I learn new things about um, rusty stuff and weird things that we find on the shoreline. One time we um, found what we believe is the um, the homestead of Alfred Lamborn that, that lived on Gunnison Island for 14 months. And so I just um, want to thank Chris a lot for coming. And I cannot wait to hear about the history of the Railroad Causeway. So take it. Take it, Chris. Thank you, Jamie. And I appreciate Ryan for taking the pinch hit and covering me. 
uh, it's very important to restart your state computer because eventually it will not give you an option and it will restart during the middle of a presentation. <laughs> so learn that lesson tonight. So thank you, Ryan, for pinch hitting uh, in that scope. So as uh, Jamie uh, mentioned, I, uh, I'm an archeologist, which means that I really like the old stuff, the broken stuff. Uh, that's why, you know, in our series, like old stuff, bird stuff, you know, Jamie's, you know, the bird stuff, I'm the old stuff. And I'm an archeologist. I work for the state of Utah. I work for the Utah Division of State History. And in particular, I work for the Utah State Historic Preservation Office. And if you looked at Laura Vernon's presentation on stakeholders that help in the management of the lake and advice and research, we fit in there. Our office's job is to promote preservation of cultural resources, uh, to assist our state and federal partners in those actions, and to give advice. Uh, forestry, fire, and state lands in particular doesn't have an archaeologist or cultural resource staff. So we fill in that gap to try to support our partners and to really protect as much of Utah's precious cultural resources as possible. Now, the Great Salt Lake to me is like kind of a great passion. And it wasn't necessarily a natural passion when I started, but I started going out to the Salt Lake, start hiking when I moved down here with my wife. And I started like, oh, what's all this old stuff out here? And as an archaeologist, I like the old stuff. I love the tangible parts of our history. And I did a lot of research on railroading in Montana for my dissertation and the, the Chinese contribution. So my love of the Great Salt Lake just radiated from the railroad, radiated to the South Shore resources. And Jamie, I credit for my exposure to the, the cutoff. Like I read about it, but I had the actual opportunity to be shoved in a Westminster van. It felt like a weird Scooby-Doo moment with like an archeologist, an architectural historian, a scientist and a poet laureate on the middle of a causeway in the Great Salt Lake. Kind of sounded like a murder mystery starting, but we all survived, at least that's what we tell everybody. So what we were supposed to do is Laura talk about the management, me talk about the history, and then Ryan come in and talk about how the historical pattern affected the lake. But I think it works this way too, is you got to see a lot of the impacts of the railroad. And now I'm going to talk to you, why is that railroad even there? And so I'm not going to belabor it because I know we're running short on time. And so hopefully, unless you lived under a rock in 2019, you know, it was the 150th anniversary of the driving of the Golden Spike, the completion of our nation's first transcontinental railroad. And that Golden Spike ceremony occurred here in Utah on Promontory Summit. A lot of people say Promontory Point, but it is the summit. The point came later in the story. And when the Central Pacific and Union Pacific raced to meet in Utah, they looked at the Great Salt Lake as a potential option. And trains like straight lines and they like flat grades. Going across the big lake accomplishes both. But the engineering in 1868, 69, and the timing needed just never manifested. And so the Central Pacific Railroad in particular built the line from, you know, Sacramento, all the way to Promontory Summit, a little bit further. And that's the way the railroad went, up around the north arm of the Great Salt Lake, through the Hog Up Mountains, uh, through the Terrace Mountains, and then dropping into the Salt Flats, east of Kelton and Monument Point, and then up into Promontory Summit. And this was the railroad, 1869 until about the late 1890s. And what happened in the 1890s is, Changes at the Southern Pacific Railroad, who had acquired the Central Pacific by this point, wanted to find a more simpler route for their trains. Uh, and so when we changed the story to loosen cutoff, this branch of the railroad became obsolete. And finally, in 1942, this northern promontory route was abandoned completely by the Southern Pacific Railroad. And now the Bureau of Land Management uh, used, uh, manages it as a, a scenic backcountry byway. And the archaeological material up there is crazy cool. Uh, because it was such a vibrant part of our state history that then just got bypassed. And so that means there's really cool stuff up there. And if you're interested in more about the transcontinental story up there, our office actually has a YouTube channel too, uh, Utah, youtube.com slash Utah State Historic Preservation Office, or just look us up. We have some interpretive videos and some materials, but let's get to the story at hand. Choo-choo trains. So, you know, we had Ryan, hard science, and then, you know, we had Jamie explain the hard science in words that you guys understand. I'm an archeologist, I prefer one syllable answers. And so choo-choo, causeway, splash, splash. That's what I know about the causeway from an environmental standpoint. But what I'm gonna tell you a little bit about tonight is the 
uh, historical development of the loosing cutoff and why did we get to the problem we had uh, with the, uh, the Northern Arm being so caused, uh, so dammed up. And so with that Northern Arm, there was three high passes and it also was 44 miles longer than going straight across the Great Salt Lake. And so for a steam engine, high grades decrease speed and it increases the burning of coal and the consumption of water. And if you've been out there, there's not a heck, of a heck of a lot of fresh water out on the Northwestern end of the Great Salt Lake. And so for the speed and efficiency of travel, the railroad was constantly thinking of a way to bypass that Northern arm. Finally in the 90s, they started doing experiments on the Great Salt Lake. Could they drive piles, those vertical pilings that railroad trestles rest on? Um, and the, it was positive. And in 1902, the railroad, Southern Pacific Railroad changed. The ownership went to a man by the name of Harriman, and he decided to finally make this a reality. And so we see the beginning and the planning of the loose end cutoff as early as about 1900 with survey crews and experiments. But in earnest, the construction really starts about 1903. So I'm a numbers guy. So let's talk about the numbers. So that Northern Promontory Branch is 144 miles from Lucerne into Ogden. The new one was gonna do 102 miles straight across the Great Salt Lake. So instantly saving 44 miles, but right across the lake. So it required 13 miles of fill. And this is the first you know, wave of construction on the cutoff. 12 miles of trestle work. That's the famous nice above water trestles like the photo here, 3000 workers many of which were ethnic immigrants. So the first transcontinental railroad was largely constructed by Irish, Chinese, uh, and you know, freed slaves, emancipated slaves, Civil War veterans, really a hodgepodge of humanity. Well, by the time we get to the 1900 period, we had already as a nation said, we don't want any Chinese in our country, so we banned their immigration. We started attacking the Japanese population of the country. So the railroad employed other ethnic in particular, Greeks and Italians were the major workforce on the new Lucene cutoff. And it took about 3,000 of them. And one cool story is that they had to build these sort of movable bunkhouses that as the construction continued, they would just move these pilings, lift up the whole bunkhouse and plop it down for the next little bit of construction. Just crazy engineering. 25 steam drivers. And I'm going to show you a picture of this. So you have these long wooden poles that the trestle rests on. Well, you need a way to drive it into the ground, into the mud. And so they, they especially purchased 25 of these that were rail mounted, had a huge steel boom, and just used gravity and just wonk, wonk. Pretty effective. That's my technical lingo, by the way. Wonk, drives it into the ground. Uh, took about three years of work and cost them about $5 million. So if we equate it to today, it'd be about $130 million construction effort across the Great Salt Lake. Uh, so if you go out to that corner of the Great Salt Lake, they were pulling gravel for all that fill from everywhere. The Lucin quarry had been developed in 1868 for the construction of the first railroad, so they expanded that. There was a new quarry built on the south end of the Hog Up Mountains, the Lakeside Mountain, which is this picture from our, our, our magical ride on the, the causeway, uh, Promontory Point site, uh, which I'll show a photo of the second wave of construction, and then Little Mountain uh, towards the Ogden end. But all this gravel had to be brought in on big side dumping train cars to keep filling in the lake to build a base. As I'm going to talk about, the base of the Great Salt Lake is really muddy and mushy, and so they had to bring in lots and lots of fill. So here's a picture of the steam uh, pile drivers. This is actually the last set of uh, trestles being pounded in. And what I just love about this photo and the star photo is you have these two massive uh, industrial machines pounding the piles into the ground. And then you see this little tugboat and a guy in the back in a rocking chair smoking a pipe. Like that sounds like a good day for me. Just sitting out there watching some guys work driving piles. Can't argue with that. But you can see by the top of that boom is where the, the drop would be. Uh, so it's a big steel ball and the posts here, and I'm gonna show you a photo of those next, are crazy. So a lot of the wood for this construction came from the Pacific Northwest. And one fun story from the Bear River side of the, the construction is they had one of these pile drivers, they had a 20 foot, foot uh, pile, they set it on the mud flat, poop, the steam driver drives it all the way below the water surface, below the mud. So then they load a 40 footer, stick that on top of where the 20 footer went in, boop, 
completely disappeared again. Finally, on the third 40 footer, they had enough resistance that it actually went above the water surface. And so they drove it through basically 60 feet of mud. Uh, and it probably still sunk another 10 feet by the time it was bypassed with a fill. So that kind of gives you an idea of the geology of the bottom of the lake that these guys were dealing with. One of the great stories is the forest that was planted in the Great Salt Lake by this construction. Now, these trees weren't living and they got pickled pretty quick. But when you think about the level of trestle work needed for the construction, it equaled about 38,000 trees or two square miles of forest. And these were the piles, those vertical posts, the bents, which are the angled parts of the trestle, which I'll show a diagram, and then the caps where they all attached then to the decking. Those are largely Oregon firs and they came in 45 foot and 70 foot lengths at this point. So that's a full 70 foot straight uh, shafted tree being driven into the Great Salt Lake. And then for the deck where the trestle is, uh, they took 2 million board feet of old growth, old growth redwood to put the decking on. Um, that's a lot of trees. Yeah, of course, they're probably still recovering a little bit from that. But I love this photo too. I'm a geek. So that is 100 foot long poles, uh, pilings that were brought in during a replacement effort. And if you look closely, you can actually see it spans three separate flat boxcar uh, chassis because these things were so massively long. And by the time they got done pile driving, there was about 10 feet above ground surface. So about 90 feet below water, uh, these things had to be driven in to create a stable enough surface. Um, real quick, diagrams of how these look, because when I use trestles and bents and all this stuff, it's technical jargon. But vertical pilings, so those, this is like a cross section of the railroad. Those are the verticals, those are the piles, and the bents are the ones that give it the sway support, and then the caps. Uh, but you can see this is actually a schematic drawing from a, a historic American engineering record documentation of loose end cutoff, just showing how all the facets work. Um, how far they were driven underground. You can see the water level, and then a, an example of the fill, sort of a diagonal shot of the same thing, this time showing those redwood uh, deck planking that were used to then put the rail and railroad ties on top. But just to give you an idea of the amount of wood needed to build this original trestle. So same as the first railroad in 1869 on May 10th, on the day after Thanksgiving in 1903, President Harriman of the Southern Pacific Railroad brought all these folks out to the middle of the lake, did the magical strike, and the first regular traffic opened up in the spring of 1904 in March. And it was heralded, it was an engineering feat, it circulated the world. Um, this was one of the largest span of water ever attempted. Uh, by a railroad and obviously had its engineering complications, uh, which was pretty interesting. Uh, a 1906 report that I got a lot of this information from mentioned like not a single person or not a single major accident occurred on this. It was a great success. Well, if you look at it, about 16 uh, Greek workers died in a massive explosion. Some of them were never found because it was a boxcar full of powder. Um, but at this point, they were just immigrant labor, so it wasn't seen as a huge tragedy in 1900. So uh, it kind of shows you how we've couched our, our use of immigrant labor and what constitutes a real disaster. Uh, a lot of Greeks and Italians and others died constructing this, but it was a success. But after it opened, it instantly had problems. That sinking into the mud continued to plague the railroad. Uh, an effort in the 1920s to assess it said basically, all the wood would have to be replaced because of the heavy impact of the salt and disturbance and the sinking and all this. Um, and at some point, they actually had to slow all the trains going across the Lucene cutoff for almost a decade to 20 miles an hour, which the whole point of the cutoff was to save time. Now they were losing time by the, the status of the railroad. Also this, this was a fire in 1956 in the middle of the trestle. Uh, so not a lot of firefighting equipment to bring out there uh, but you know they brought water tenders in but that shut down the trestle for years and so the wood the sinking all this created issues so we had a problem the railroad was going to fix it so instead of having a big old trestle that kept sinking they're going to fill it 
And so a lot of these old quarries were then put into service. And in 1959, they expanded the fill basically to span the entire length of the, the cutoff. And they were pulling in huge amounts of gravel and fill from Little Harbor, which is on the west side of Promontory Point. Uh, this harbor is still there. And there's great photos of all these huge barges bringing in fill after fill after fill to get this thing filled up. Um, if you're a real big geek, on YouTube is this film. Uh, the Morrison Knudsen Company, or the MK Company, got the contract to fill in the Lusane Cutoff in 1957 when they were contracted. They had a huge promotional video showing all the boats in action, the explosions. It's a hoot. It's about 30 minute little promotional video. Uh, check it out. Jamie has the link to share. But if you're a geek like me on just the history of it, but then also watching big machines do things, it's cool. Just see nature be destroyed. It's really awesome. Um, and so the original trestle was bypassed so they could build the solid fill and then let train traffic still continue. So that's what became that trestle wood as once this was abandoned, all the traffic went to the fill. This was left to basically just desiccate and disappear. So that's where a lot of the salvage efforts came in. Um, so with the new fill, there were no more fires, nothing really to burn, sinking a little bit. Um, but it was a more effective solution than the trestling. And this is that cutoff that Ryan showed showing the new concrete piles that were driven in that cutoff. But the railroad was meant in 1902 to have the train tracks at about 4,213 feet above sea level. Um, within about 10 years, that dipped to about 4,208. And that was just because the train was sinking. And it was variable too. You might be at 4,213 and then you drop for five feet and then you go back up. It was like a roller coaster ride, one of the engineers used to say. In 1959, they raised the elevation up higher. They wanted the tracks at 4,218 feet, but these were now bigger trains with heavier loads. And so it sank again. So we lost about 10 feet within about 10 years in certain parts of the railroad where it's sinking. And so this created issues when we talk about too much water. And we fast forward into the 1980s. And most people don't think the 80s are history, but they're history. All this stuff fits into a broader pattern of why we solved this problem with a fill. Um, and so with that sinking and then the Great Salt Lake actually rising so precipitously in the early 1980s, there was points where the lake was just cresting completely over the active causeway. And so the Southern Pacific, Union Pacific Railroads jumped into action. And this is one of the cool stories that I actually kind of learned from Jamie is, the boxcar riprap, the boxcar seawall was installed in the 1983. And this was on the south side of the, the causeway where they brought in 1,430 uh, unused and surplus boxcars and just dropped them into the lake along the side of the causeway and then filled rock on top of them to actually raise about seven feet above where the causeway was and then put the, the tracks elevated on that just to protect the railroad. But just think about 1,400 uh, boxcars being dropped in a major effort. And then within a few years, you know, the lake has obviously gone back and these things are now high and dry. But just this constant battle with the lake has continued for over 100 years of railroading. So the causeway, the solid fill, this dam was great for trains, but really bad for the water. And so this was the natural segue that I was going to set up Ryan to talk about the science of the North Arm, but he's already done that. So I don't need to segue to nothing. So I will stop here. And hopefully that was um, somewhat informative on how we historically got this causeway and, and how that developed over time. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Hey, I have a question for you. Um, I think at one point you talked about in the Uintas, um, you had done some research um, in the Uintas and logging in the Uintas. Did any of those trees end up into Great Salt Lake and the railroad causeway? No, by the time the 1900 period was going on with the construction in this part, most of that railroad ties were actually coming from the Sierras and mm -hmm. Northern California. The Uinta Mountains, like the Bear River, Black's Fork, and Smith's Fork ranges, a lot of those railroad ties were used uh, by the UP and Evanston, Wyoming, all the way probably into Echo mm -hmm. and parts into Hannaford. Uh, but the other wood coming in from California was bird. 
by some of this Western end. Got it. Got it. Whew. Well, awesome. Thank you for helping us. Um, I would love to open this up to questions. We've answered a, a few of these questions. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about too, and maybe Laura can shed some light on this while we're um, waiting for any questions to come in, is the idea of these navigable waters and, and maintaining navigability between the, the north side and the south side of that causeway. Could you talk about that a little bit? Because I think it's really important, you know, I, I think, you know, when they originally put the causeway in, I don't know that there was much thought to water transfer, you know, and mixing between those. The thought was more about maintaining navigability so that the state of Utah could also um, maintain um, control of Great Salt Lake. Do you know anything about that, Laura? Um, I don't know to what extent it, they were thinking about the flows in between. I, it's my initial reaction that they probably didn't, but I know they had navigability in mind. When they created the causeway, there's photos of a very small boat going through the, um, the culverts that used to be there. And so when you showed the picture of your boat going through, that was so cool. I got super excited because the when the culverts were plugged back in 2012, there was absolutely no way you could fit even a kayak um, through the the existing culverts or the culverts that were there for so long. So um, it's been in the mind of the state for a long time, the navigability piece, but I don't know about the piece for water. I don't know why you call it water quality or what? But. Yeah, when, when I worked for the shrimpers, um, we would go through the causeway to sample the North Arm and, and we would go through one of those little original culverts. And I remember my boss being like, hey, just like stick your foot out and make sure that we don't hit the side of that. And it always sounded very safe. Oh. <laughs> Not at all. But over the yeah. years, over the years, I mean, I saw them shrink from 1999 until they closed. Did they close them in 2016? Uh, 2012, I think the first one closed and then 17, the second one, or maybe it was 13 and 16, but yeah, right around there. So between, you know, um, 1999 and 2012, 2012. Or mm -hmm. um, I saw them shrink a lot, uh, sink into the ground. Um, I know Chris, Chris is answering this question um, and maybe he can do it live, but Anne wants to know, did the railroad ever do the math on whether it was financially worth it for the first hundred years? So I don't have any evidence of them doing that, um, but the railroads were very meticulous and very particular on their cost and return. And so I guarantee you there was probably some engineers by the 19 teens getting brought to the mat of like, you told us to do what? Um, especially, and, and by the time the Northern Arm was uh, defunct, the investment in trying to find another way around the lake was probably didn't pencil either. So it was one of those things like you buy an old house and you keep putting money in it because it's easier than trying to buy a new house. Um, but yeah, I don't have any evidence the railroads did that. And Aaron wants to know um, from Chris, do you have other archeological finds of the building of the causeway that would hint at the people who helped build it? Um, and and Aaron, Aaron is a teacher, so maybe we can work with her, Chris. We always love to work with teachers, but what a great connection for fourth grade evidence of change of life in Utah. Oh, that's a, that is a great question, Aaron. And um, I've spent a lot of time on the original railroad grade um, and so many examples of the Chinese workers camps and the material culture is still out there expressing that cultural heritage and Irish heritage is being expressed, even Japanese materials we found on the Northern Arm. Um, the central, the Lucent cutoff is really tricky because so little of it is actually public land. Uh, most of it is still active railroad grade. And so there's really been no systematic survey for workers camps out there. And then the thing that I love is you know, most people don't think about Utah as an underwater archaeology state, but I bet if we started doing some scuba diving along the edges of the causeway, especially where those worker camps were elevated, bet under the, sh the water of the Great Salt Lake, there's probably a 
bunch of material culture that was just chucked over the side and sunk to the bottom. So that actually might be kind of a fun underwater archaeology dig. But right now we don't have any known sites for the workers camps, but I know they're there. We just haven't looked. But no, I completely agree. It does talk about you know, change in immigrant communities. It talks about socioeconomics. It talks about trade and commerce. You know, it's a great way. You know, that's why I love archaeology because it's a very tangible way of connecting the past, the present, and using that that thing as the the linkage um, connecting to the past. How how did do you, do you know, Chris? I uh, remember seeing pictures of like how they kind of like they would they had like a structure on the end of the causeway and then they would slowly just build out from that do you remember what that that little building was called that you see there were it was like almost a town in the middle of the causeway yeah so the yeah the mid lake station was the big famous station where there was like a depot and like a viewing platform and it was the place to go chill but yeah as they were moving the trestle and they were building yeah there was like the pile drivers you know, at the end of the track and then like a worker's camp just right next to it. And then as it moved, the rail moved and, and those steam drivers are on the rail. So they would then lay track, move it another hundred yards and keep going. So that little shack at the beginning was sort of like the foreman, the engineers, the surveyors, uh, and then the workers were all there too. So it, it would have been a fascinating thing to watch that original construction in time-lapse. Yeah, too bad. Um, Clayton wants to know, um, there's a major effort in monitoring salinity. What are the ramifications of salinity changes? Uh, maybe I can, nobody, el nobody else is taking this, so I'm going to start. <laughs> Actually, um, you know, Dr. Bonnie Baxter and myself, we have um, we just co-edited a book called um, Great Salt Lake Biology, um, A Terminal Lake in a Time of Change, where we really asked all of the 16 different chapter authors um, to, to think about Great Salt Lake in a time of change of both water diversions and climate change. And um, since we're talking about the life in Great Salt Lake, salinity actually plays a major, major role in, how, in what can live there. Um, and, and, and I like to remind people that Great Salt Lake isn't just salty. It's not just a salty lake. It, it's the most diverse place on the planet in terms of um, salinity, in terms of salt content of the water. So you have not only fresh water, but then you also have um, um, hypersaline, super saturated hypersaline water and everything in between. And, um, and so when we start to see water um, coming out, not getting to Great Salt Lake or evaporating faster due to increased temperatures, less precipitation, we see dramatic shifts in the, the salt content of the water. And right now, um, you know, we have heard a little bit about the brine shrimp and brine shrimp are um, kind of on the edge of, of doing okay at these salinities that we're starting to see. So they really like salinities between, you know, nine and 13% salinity. And the south arm of Great Salt Lake is getting saltier, the less water um, that's in, in there diluting that salt, it's getting saltier. So um, we see dramatic shifts in the microorganisms that are at the bottom of the food chain. And then we start to see um, changes to the macroinvertebrates like the brine shrimp and the seed shrimp and all of the midges and all of the critters there. So we're uh, there are serious repercussions and we need to really know about um, what the salinity is doing. And maybe Bonnie wants to answer that a little bit more. Well, I, I, this year we were funded by Forestry, Fire and State Lands at, at the state of Utah, which Laura represents, um, to study uh, photosynthesis in the lake and the primary production that happens in the lake. And we're really curious about these structures I'm showing. Um, we call them microbialites, which is the parent term for um, things you might have heard of stromatolites. Um, they're basically microbes that build rocks um, in systems all over the world, even in the Arctic. 
Um, they, they are cyanobacteria that make mats that do photosynthesis and cause the calcium carbonate in the water to precipitate and form a rock. So we have the largest expanse in the world. And these mats of cyanobacteria are likely providing the bulk of production in our system. And they're very sensitive to salinity. Um, if, if I were to stop sharing and you look behind me, if you can see me, um, these are what happens to the microbialites when they're in the north arm of the lake. They get salted over and encrusted and they're no longer productive and they're not doing photosynthesis. So um, salinity is really important for this foundational layer of Great Salt Lake. And I imagine that that has shivers up the entire ecosystem. And um, Anne Neville wants to know, Laura, if you're gonna have to close the breach to save the brine shrimp. So are, are we gonna have to you know, close that breach off so that all of that fresh water that comes into the south arm of Great Salt Lake stays in the south arm of Great Salt Lake and does not go into the north arm? Well, that's a question I'd like to put on the Salinity Advisory Committee. <laughs> um, like I said, it's not just one division's um, responsibility to make that call just what is the ideal salinity range and when do we start moving rocks or earth to make, to, to change the salinity in the south arm. So nice question, Anne, but um, I'm not gonna answer it. <laughs> uh, we don't know the answer yet about what is the best path. And I- Bonnie's I on the salinity advisory committee, by the way, everybody. Yep, <laughs> yep. Um, and and we've too. been- We've been working pretty hard about, um, you know, with respect to identifying what are the salinity param parameters for each life form in the lake and um, how would that impact, how would each salinity range impact industry and ecology and all of the parameters that we're dealing with. So it's a really complicated equation, um, but we have a lot of good brains in the room and I'm really excited about working with these folks. In fact, that picture I showed was taken by Jeff Demblinker, who's leading that charge. So that's really amazing. And when I think about closing the causeway to save the brine shrimp, I think about the pelicans, right? Because um, that's just gonna make more land bridges um, to Gunnison Island where the one of the world's largest population, one of the largest um, breeding areas for American white pelicans are. And so it gives me um, a little bit of uh, uh, like, I have to like take some deep breaths and fan myself because um, that would mean more impact to the pelicans. We already know that coyotes are on Gunnison Island. We've seen other um, mammalian predators, fox, um, and humans. So it kind of gives me a little bit of my heart stops a little bit. Do we have any more questions from anybody or um, do any panelists want to say something that they forgot to say or didn't say or? Final words. Final words. It's a horrible way to phrase it. <laughs> well, well you you started with the the obituary so yeah, right, kind of, right, that, right, that right, really right. wrapped it all up <laughs> final, so words. Final, final words might be appropriate yes I, I did have one question about the obituary did you ask the woman reading it to like sound like she's on the verge of tears because she sounded like that and then I felt like that when she was reading it she she really was like that um, that was one of our oh. students who graduated and now she's a graduate student um, at Utah, uh, Oregon State University. Um, and we sent out our obituary to say, hey, you know, you graduates used to work with us. What do you think? And she sent back her reading the obituary and crying. And it was so emotional to us to hear it in her voice. Someone, you know, who had worked with us and has now moved on. Um, from this area. So that was her own thing and it was real. And it was uh, organic. We didn't ask for it. And yeah. so 
So, I mean, I would love to just close, um, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, how, how do you have hope for Great Salt Lake? You know, we talk about this obituary that we envisioned in the future, if we don't change um, what we're doing right now, if we don't change some of the things that, that we're, some of the ways that we're impacting Great Salt Lake. And I do have hope because we have all of these smart people that um, are working together and that are partnering like we never have before and um, that are all working towards a common goal of, of um, Great Salt Lake, be it for the birds or be it, be it for the people, be it for the economy, be it for our quality of life. And so um, I have hope. I think if we don't change our ways, um, we will find ourselves in a predicament. Um, so I encourage all of our audience members to, you know, do what they can and be part of this tapestry, not a puzzle, but this tapestry of people that are doing the things in their own control in their life or in their work. Um, to, to not kill Great Salt Lake, to maintain a viable ecosystem for the birds and the people um, and for our place. So um, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I feel so proud that we get to share all of this really awesome information with you. Um, this will be, uh, this is already on YouTube. Um, we will break the talks up into individual talks and it will be on our YouTube channel um, in the next week. So thank you. Thank you for coming everybody. Bye-bye. Have a good night.